Hello. I've done a lot of videos around this topic, but it occurred to me I've never done one big good video on the Great Vowel Shift as it's understood by historical linguists, so I'm going to do that today. Um, I find that people's understanding of the Great Vowel Shift ranges from being very good to uh, being decent in terms of the actual detail but not really understanding why these kinds of sound changes happen or how they happen to just using the Great Vowel Shift as a kind of catch-all term for any sound change that's ever happened in the history of English. Now the Great Vowel Shift actually refers to a specific um, related set of sound changes that started in probably the East Midlands um, in around the 1300s. Um, it's always hard to tell from writing because writing often lags behind actual pronunciation in terms of changes. Um, but it, it refers to a very specific set of sound changes. Um, and these sound changes are part of a common phenomenon that's called a chain shift, well, which, which I'll explain later uh, in more detail. But chain shifts are a common type of sound change. The only reason this is called the Great Vowel Shift, the reason it's seen as so important in the history of English pronunciation, is that it happened at such a time in history as it now affects all modern dialects of English. There have been plenty of chain shifts since then that are on a similar scale in terms of their acoustic effects on the language. Um, the, the New Zealand vowel shift, for example, um, the Cockney vowel shift, the uh, even even the still playing out vowel shift between traditional received pronunciation and modern southeastern British uh, pronunciation. Um, you know, there are plenty of examples of chain shifts in the history of English, but this one just happened to occur at a time in history that means it now affects all modern dialects. So I think because there are so many good basic explanations of the great vowel shift on the internet, I'm going to give you a more kind of intuitive explanation that maybe helps you get your head into it a bit more. So to do that, I'm going to use an example that isn't the great vowel shift, but that is a kind of analogous change that's happened more recently. Consider the differences between traditional received pronunciation, like you might hear on a sort of 1960s BBC News broadcast, and traditional Cockney pronunciation that you might expect to hear in a pub in London in the 1960s or 70s, or you might still hear today. There are regular correspondences between how RP speakers would say words and how Cockney speakers would say words. So take these words as examples. Team. Tame. Tame. Time. 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 I won't have done these perfectly, but hopefully they're decent approximations. Now, if you listen carefully, if you try and break through the the, the kind of ingrained sociological ideas we have about the kinds of people that have these accents, you might notice that the Cockney speaker's pronunciation of certain vowels corresponds to a different vowel, uh, in some cases, in the speech of the RP speaker. So the, um, the fleece vowel in the Cockney accent, E, sounds probably more similar to the RP speaker's face vowel, A than it does to the RP speaker's fleece vowel. This is an example of a chain shift, um, or, or rather it's the result of a chain shift that's happened in Cockney English that hasn't happened in traditional RP. Traditional RP in this case uh, preserves the more conservative um, vowel qualities, and Cockney English um, has innovated the vowel qualities according to a chain shift where each vowel's quality has kind of dropped into the position of the one next to it. And because that's a really awful explanation without, without any graphics, I'm going to now uh, kind of show this in graphical form. If you look at the vowel space in terms of um, acoustics, so this is the first formant plotted against the second formant, it's, it's a way of visualising how vowels sound. Um, you'll see that the two Cockney vowels here start off with lower tongue positions than their corresponding RP vowels. This whole part of the vowel system has just moved lower in the mouth in the Cockney accent. It's very common that when one vowel changes its tongue position in a vowel system, other vowels around it also change their tongue position. These are what's called chain shifts and you can see loads of examples of them across English accents. 
In the description, I'll link just one of Dr. Jeff Lindsay's videos on the chain shift that produced the modern New Zealand English vowel system. Dr. Lindsay has also described a chain shift affecting southeastern British English in the last 50 or 60 years, which I've mentioned, changing posh middle class RP English into posh middle class 2020s English. The vowel in kit lowers so that it becomes kit. The vowel in dress lowers to dress. The vowel in cat lowers to cat. In fact, textbooks teaching English as a second language haven't caught up with some of these sound changes yet, which is why you'll hear Germans approximating the English trap vowel as e, trap, ket, rather than using their own a vowel, trap, cat, which is closer, although not identical, to the quality that most southern British English speakers use. These change shifts happen because the vowel system in your language wants to keep a certain shape. It wants vowels to be as different from each other as possible to minimise the chances of you getting words confused with each other. Now obviously the vowel system itself isn't conscious and the exact mechanisms of this aren't very well understood, although I'll try to get into them a bit later. But it seems that consciously or unconsciously people avoid their different vowel phonemes being too similar to each other because similarity causes potential confusion between similar words. In extreme cases, vowels can merge together. So many American English speakers have merged the vowels in cot and court, or rot and wrought, so that they sound like cart, cart, rat, rat. In this case, the merger doesn't cause too much confusion because context usually helps you work out which word the person is saying. It's not just a case of vowels running away from other vowels to avoid merging with them. Let's say a vowel disappears from a system by merging with another vowel. There's now a load of extra space in the system, and some of the other vowels might take this opportunity to spread out and become even more acoustically different from each other. By this process, in some cases, if vowel A drifts away from vowel B, vowel B might even chase it to fill the space it's left. So you can have a push chain where one vowel pushes another vowel which pushes another vowel and causes a domino effect that way or a pull chain where one vowel drifts, another vowel chases it, and all the other vowels get pulled along in that way. These are normal phenomena that happen in modern languages all the time. Now we turn to historical evidence from the Great Vowel Shift. It's clear that the pronunciation of English has changed a lot over the last thousand years. Reconstructed accents can sound a bit weird to modern ears, so it's sometimes easier to imagine that Shakespeare and Chaucer must have just pronounced things almost the same way we do but this becomes untenable very quickly when you think about it. Why do German words clearly related to English words have different vowels in them? Ich sehe, but I see. Käse, or Käse, but cheese. Why do old loan words from Latin have such different vowels to the ones that Romance languages now use? Any word that had a long vowel in Latin that was borrowed into English before about 1500, the vowel in English is drastically different to the one you find in modern Romance languages. We say sensation, not sensation. We say relation, not relation. We say postnatal, not postnatal. Bovine, not bovine. You could reasonably argue that this is because Latin words came into English partly through people reading Latin, not hearing it. So if they already thought that this letter is pronounced as an A, that's how they're going to read the Latin word. This is probably true to some extent, but it brings us to another point. Why do we associate this letter with an A sound? Other European languages don't really do this. It's normally something like A. The same goes for all of the vowels. Who the hell heard the English vowels A, E, I, O, U and decided to spell them like this when the normal realisations of these sounds in Europe are A, E, I, O, U? Even though we now think of them as being similar in English, a is very acoustically different from a. O is very acoustically different from o. Spelling these sounds with these letters would be a really weird decision for someone to make unless they already knew about the modern English tradition of doing that. Phoneticians writing in the late 15 and early 1600s give us a good idea about what the London vowel system was like at that time. It's easy to think that it's impossible to reconstruct a London accent from this period, but people actually described it in quite modern detail. From descriptions of tongue positions that they give, it seems like the long vowels fell within the range of modern English dialects, although not necessarily London dialects. A in place, nace, kate. E in fleece, meat, geese. 
A in name, cake, face. O in oat, no, hose. O in goose, loose, boot. And O in home, bought and own, which now has a different vowel. These may sound weirdly different to modern London vowel qualities, but a lot of lines of evidence point to them. I'll link a video in the description that goes over a couple. When you look at these vowels and you look at the spellings they take, with a bit of knowledge of phonetics there is a pattern. With the exception of the vowels in price and house, all of these vowels are just a bit higher in the vowel space than their spellings would suggest if you were going by normal European spelling standards. Where you'd expect a e in fleece, mate, guess, you get the slightly higher e, fleece, meat, geese. Where you'd expect a e in nam, kark, fas, you get the higher a e in name, cake, face. Where you'd expect o e in gos, los, bot, you get u, goose, loose, boot. This pattern doesn't hold across all of the vowels. You'd expect an o e in home, bot, own, and that's exactly what you get. So what's the difference between home, bought, own, and goose, loose, boot? Well, in Old English pre-Battle of Hastings, these words were spelt with an O, which again suggests gorse, loss, bought. But these words were all spelt with an A, as if they were pronounced something like ham, bat, an. In fact, reconstructions show a similar but slightly more backed harm, bart, arn. This vowel, a, uh, has a lower tongue position than o. So our pattern here would be explained very neatly if Middle English had two long o-like sounds. One with a slightly higher tongue position, gorse, loss, bought, and one with a slightly lower tongue position, harm, bought, on. When gorse raised to goose, harm raised to fill its place as home. So that's a nice little model of how an earlier long vowel system that made sense with the spelling might have become a later vowel system that didn't anymore through a normal chain shift where all the vowels moved to a higher tongue position. This explains price and house as well. These letters would suggest e and u, pris, hus, the highest possible vowels in the vowel space. If a chain shift was causing every vowel to raise, E and U would have nowhere to raise to because they're at the highest tongue position. So instead of raising, they do something else. In New Zealand English, when all the front vowels raised, the kit vowel was at the highest tongue position, so instead of raising, it just became a central vowel. Cut, butter. But in this case, it seems like they become diphthongs or gliding vowels. Pris becomes place, hus becomes hos. In fact, if you can't believe the place becoming place thing, look to the more recent Cockney vowel shift I mentioned earlier. The exact same vowel change has happened with team and fleece becoming tame and fleece. So this looks like a standard normal chain shift that would explain everything. Is there any evidence for it in writing? In Lincolnshire in the first half of the 1300s, we see spelling evidence suggesting that the goose vowel had raised in some words where it would normally be spelt with an O or two O's, suggesting the vowel quality OR. Some people spell it with OU, which normally represented the vowel in words like hoose, moose. So instead of dawing something, you would do something. Words usually spelt as if they were pronounced talk, road, blood, started to be sporadically spelled as if they were pronounced talk, rood, blood. This pattern becomes more common into the 1400s not affecting all words by all writers, but this almost makes the evidence more convincing. It's clearly not just some change in spelling convention that's spreading around the country, but writers independently noticing a feature of their own accent. Then throughout the 1400s, you see the same pattern with words spelt with the letter E, which would normally be E in European languages, sometimes being spelt with an I or Y, suggesting a raising from E to E. The Paston letters from the East Midlands have a lot of this. What's usually a pair becomes a peer. What's usually keep becomes keep. At this stage, it seems like the raising was happening in some regional accents, but not all. The Paston letters also have evidence of the letter I being replaced with EY. A bead becomes a bade. There's not as much of this with the vowel in mouth and house. 
The linguist Roger Lass, who I'm getting a lot of this information from, has a very good explanation for this. In Middle English, this vowel was often spelled O-U, after the French convention of using O-U to represent the O sound. But when the O sound changed to a gliding vowel, a diphthong, the resulting gliding vowel was probably something like O, and O-U is a pretty phonetically accurate way of spelling O if you're going by normal European pronunciations of these vowels. So it makes sense that people would keep this spelling the same even if their own regional accent had changed the vowel. All of a sudden, their pronunciation fell more in line with what you'd expect by European spelling standards. It's a lot harder to tell exactly when the R vowel raised to O because there was so much overlap in spelling between the goose vowel and the goat vowel. But what is clear is that originally, as well as having two mid-height back vowels, as in got and gorse, there were also two mid-front vowels, the one in fleis, but also a separate one in words like meat, heat and reed. At some point after the fleis vowel had raised to fleis in at least some parts of the country, this met vowel raises to met, and then it carries on raising, and all of a sudden they merge. You start to see people in rhyming poetry rhyming words in the meat set with words in the meat set. This was something you didn't see before a certain date. I think it's worth stopping for a second to talk about rhyming evidence, and I'll probably do a longer form video on this at some point. But it's important to remember that um, as adults, we're not very sensitive to contrasts between vowels that aren't important in our own native language. So it can be easy to sort of listen to reconstructions of older stages of English where vowel distinctions were made slightly differently, and to think that two vowels basically rhymed, even when they might not have rhymed to a native speaker of that stage of English. So uh, the fact that a e and air e might sound similar to some English speakers nowadays, or or and or might sound similar to some English speakers nowadays. Um, this doesn't mean that speakers at the time would have thought of these vowels as rhyming with each other or constituting basically the same vowel category. Um, the way we learn about how people thought about vowels categorically is by um, looking at how they behaved in relation to those vowels. So did they rhyme words with this vowel and words with this vowel? Even if they might sound similar to us, that doesn't mean that they rhymed at the time. So uh, a, an example that's more intuitive to a modern English speaker might be if a Spanish speaker was learning modern English, they might be tempted in a poem to rhyme the words eat and kit, um, because in Spanish that fine vowel distinction isn't made and they both sound kind of like the Spanish e vowel. But in English, or in most dialects of modern English, you would never think to rhyme eat and kit, because even though that is a very small acoustic difference, to an English speaker nowadays, it's an important acoustic difference. The last step in the shift seems to have been the face vowel raising, probably from fast to, at first, face, and then to face. Because this came at the tail end of the vowel shift and the raising of all the other long vowels had left the lower part of the vowel space fairly empty, you could argue that the face vowel was a bit torn. There was pressure for it to move upwards in the front edge of the vowel space because the meat vowel, the next highest vowel, had become very high. Um, but if the face vowel raised too much, that would leave the lower half of the vowel space very empty, especially in terms of long vowels. This seems to have resulted in a very protracted raising process that happened faster in some dialects than others. A key time for this was the late 15 and early 1600s, when Shakespeare was writing and also when phoneticians were starting to describe their own pronunciation. So we have pretty good documentary evidence that even within London, different people had different face vowels. Last points out that Hart, writing in 1569, says that the face vowel is the same as the trap vowel but held for longer. Trap, fas. But sources from the same time, where French people were describing English pronunciation, like Jacques Bellet, say that the English face vowel is almost equivalent to the French air vowel. So around the same time in the late 1500s, there were probably some Londoners saying fas, some saying fas, and some saying fas. The higher pronunciations seem to have won the competition here, and by the mid-1600s, something like fas, or even fes, was probably normal. Whatever modern dialect you speak, the London vowel system straight after the Great Vowel Shift probably isn't the exact same system as yours. In fact, for me, all of these long vowels have now changed in quality, some more than others. 
but the post-vowel shift qualities fall within the range of what you find in modern dialects, and the pre-vowel shift qualities mostly don't. The only major exception, as far as I can see, is that the mouth vowel didn't diphthongize in some northern dialects because their vowel systems were differently shaped to begin with. So the vowel shift took a different path, and that's why in Scots, for example, you get monothongal pronunciations of hoose, moose. The actual scope of the great vowel shift was fairly small, considering the credit people sometimes give it for totally transforming English, and the reason pre-vowel shift dialects sound so weird to us nowadays is just because there aren't any of them around. This makes it hard for us to intuitively imagine pre-vowel shift dialects really being how people spoke in real life, and I imagine it's part of the reason that a lot of people in my London accent through the ages video found it so hard to believe. But it's useful to step back and look at our biases here. It feels more intuitive to think that maybe people in the 1400s spoke with something more similar to a modern English accent, just maybe with different underlying pronunciations, whatever that means, because we're used to modern English accents being used in natural speech, and we're not used to these reconstructed accents being used in natural speech. It can feel like our own modern range of accents are more neutral and realistic, and it doesn't help that a lot of recordings of reconstructed Middle English sound laboured or rehearsed, because it's obviously not the speaker's own native accent. But differences in the sounds of accents are completely mechanical, related to the physics of how your body produces speech. They sometimes feel like this magical thing that gets layered over the top of speech, and it's socially useful for our brains to think of them in this way, because then we can take them and use them to categorise people and assume information about them. Sometimes helpful, sometimes not. So we think about and talk about accents as if they're these things that you can layer onto your speech that are intrinsically linked to social identity, and maybe this way of thinking about it leads to us imagining that the English language could be very fundamentally different, even at the level of pronunciation, but still somehow have a modern English accent. I can actually give you a concrete example of this from a conversation I once had with someone. I told them that the meat vowel before the great vowel shift was probably e, mate, and they asked, why do you have to put on that kind of Scottishy accent when you're doing it? Why can't you just say mate with a modern English accent? The answer is because a and e are two quite different sounds with different acoustic properties, and the evidence points to e in this case, not a. A Middle English speaker wouldn't have thought of these as the same sound with a different accent. In fact, in some Middle English dialects, they were two different phonemes with they and they being two completely different words that people didn't think of as sounding the same as each other. As modern English speakers, we only think of a and a as being related to each other because at this particular moment in history, that forms a socially relevant accent difference. Where some accents have a, say, they, be, other accents have a, say, they, be. It's useful for us to think of them as the same sound in two different accents, whereas in reality, they're just two different sounds and the relationship we see between them is purely socially conditioned. These socially conditioned ideas of accent change as actual pronunciation changes. The exact system of pronunciation that I'm speaking with now carries certain social connotations that differ depending on where you're from. If you're from the south of England, you probably think I sound middle class or maybe vaguely on the lower side of average middle class. If you're from other parts of the Anglosphere, you might think I sound posh. If you played my accent to someone from 1910, they'd probably think my accent sounded weird and pretty working class. I say I and ow instead of I and ow. In the name Victoria Ashmore, I put a r sound between Victoria and Ashmore, even though there isn't one in spelling, a feature decried as working class in the 1800s, but now the norm in southeastern British English. So ideas about accents change over time, what constitutes a normal accent changes over time, and crucially, if a particular system of pronunciation goes extinct, people stop thinking of it as normal pretty much immediately. It's not just that they stop thinking about it as proper English, but it ceases to even be an option of how you could pronounce English. Listen to this recording of Cumbrian from the 1960s. I think it's a lot different now to what the way I went to scale. You see, in a lot of ways, it's you see, when I went to scale, we had sort of a, a rather a fussy old sort of a scale master. He wasn't a bad scale master all the bit. Realizations of vowels are completely out of the realm of modern pronunciation, even the modern pronunciation of a lot of Northern English speakers, but were the norm for this speaker. Hopefully this has helped get some people into the headspace of thinking about historical accents as being potentially very different from modern ones, and in turn, helped the great vowel shift seem less counterintuitive. 
To finish off, here's a demonstration of the long vowels slowly drifting away from the short vowels in London accents during the Great Vowel Shift. I feel a blister on me face. Child, go in the house and get the gorses mat. I feel a blister on me face. Child, go in the house and get the gorses mat. I feel a blister on me face. Child, go in the house and get the gorses mat. I feel a blister on me face. Child, go in the house and get the gooses mat. I feel a blister on me face. Child, go in the house and get the gooses meat. I feel a blister on me face. Child, go in the house and get the gooses meat.